and uh, first of all, many thanks for inviting me to be here in Riga. I was here last year as well for a conference we did um, back then with the uh, Danish Embassy, also on energy efficiency. So it's obviously great to see so many people in the room and to hear that this is a topic that's really important to all of you. Thank you to the Minister, thank you to the Ambassador, and thank you to my local Danfoss colleagues for uh, putting a lot of work into making sure that we're here today. Thank you also to both the Minister and the Ambassador for making quite a few of the points that I want to make here today, namely that energy efficiency really is an opportunity for all of us. Um, a couple of words about myself. My name is Judy Kieschip, and I'm Head of Public and Industry Affairs for Danfoss Heating Solutions. And what does that then mean? It basically means that I am based in Brussels and I'm in charge of making sure that energy efficiency and renewables and sustainability and environmental issues and all those things connected to that are high on the EU agenda. And now why do I do that? I obviously do it because we need to sell products, let's be honest here, as Danfoss. But I'm also very fortunate, I think, to be working uh, in a sector and for a company where what's good for us as Danfoss is actually also good for society at large. Um, and I'll get back, be getting back to that later on in the presentation. A couple of words about my uh, company, Danfoss. Um, as you can see up here, we are a Danish-based company, but now with operations all over the world, including here in Latvia. We have uh, 80 years' experience um, doing a lot of things related to climate and energy. And, and I think certainly, as the ambassador also mentioned, the fact that we are based in Denmark, where there's a very strong culture of energy efficiency, has certainly helped us in also developing um, our market and our knowledge. Here is just a brief overview of some of the things we do. And we basically do everything from sort of small thermostats that go into sort of residential housing, um, all the way up to components for district energy systems and um, very large sort of production units. But the common denominator for everything we do really is sort of climate and energy. And I don't want you to be thinking that I'm standing here telling you what you should do without Danfoss doing anything ourselves. So just to illustrate that we don't just talk the talk, but also walk the walk. Um, here are some of the things we're doing as a group to make sure that we're facing um, a sustainable and competitive future for, for all of us. Um, in particular, I'd like to... to have you noticed the 25, 25, 25 targets that we've set up um, as Danfoss? And just seeing that we're here with um, representatives uh, from Denmark as well, an example of one of the things we have concretely done as Danfoss, um, the Danish Council Presidency of the EU, um, the so-called Tap Water Presidency, had a particular focus on being sustainable, and Danfoss was part of, of, of making that um, the case by sponsoring thermostats for all the uh, venues. So that was a bit about me, that was a bit about Danfoss, and now on to today's topics and to the world that we are uh, living in. We are facing uh, a number of major issues or challenges, as we call them, to be a bit more positive. One of them is um, resource scarcity. And it's pretty simple, really. When you look at sort of the planet globally, we are becoming more. We are consuming more energy because globally, more wealth is coming to people. That means that they will be investing in more things at home, and all that consumes energy. Now, at the same time, we are facing an energy market that's getting more and more expensive. So that means we consume more energy, and we pay more for that energy. Now, that's unfortunate, of course, because that means that we're tying up more and more of our money into activities that are not cool to what we're doing. And by that, I mean if you're an industry and you're producing, let's say, car tires, then it's not your core competence to work in energy issues, but you are spending more and more of your money and of your time uh, making money to cover those costs. The same goes for the public authorities. If you have a kindergarten, then what you want to do is make sure those kids are having a good time and are being taught something, not that you can cover your energy bills. Now, this is obviously unfortunate at any time, but it's particularly unfortunate we're also uh, facing a financial crisis because at the moment, money is scarce, so we don't want to be spending all that money on those costs covering energy. The last major issue we're facing, I think, and it goes with the financial crisis, of course, is unemployment. Um, I don't have the figures for Latvia specifically, but I know that as an EU average, 12% of the workers in the construction sector are currently unemployed. So that means, just very directly tied to this sector, we have 12% of the workforce basically not doing the work they could be doing and instead getting some sort of subsidy from the state that we're also paying for. 
Now, that was all doom and gloom. Um, I did promise you that I was going to be talking about opportunities, and here they are. Energy efficiency is an opportunity for all of us. I stole here a quote from Monica Frassoni, who is the former president. She just retired from the European Alliance to Save Energy. And what she says, and I think she's so right, she says, if we were in the US, the Energy Efficiency Directive would be called the Jobs and Recovery Act. Because for me, that's also what energy efficiency is about. It's about creating jobs. It's about creating growth. It's also about the energy security element that your uh, minister talked about. And, of course, it's also about climate protection. We might think that the, more is the other issues are more pressing, but we do still have a climate change problem and that we want to challenge along with the other things here. Now, Europe has agreed on an energy efficiency directive. Again, your minister alluded to it. 2012 was a hard year in Brussels in terms of, of, of policy. We all fought very hard to get what we thought was a, a really quite an ambitious directive. And again, thank you to the Danes for really sort of shepherding through that through their uh, uh, presidency. But now it's up to you at local level. The European Union has set up the directive, so the overall shape, but it's now up to Latvia and up to your government to make sure that you implement as ambitiously as possible. Because it's no good that we do a lot of work at European level if it's not implemented. If we don't do anything, we're not going to derive any sort of benefit from it. I mean, that must be clear. So what is it then that I think that energy efficiency can do for us? Well, I think there are three big parameters. First of all, there's the growth and the jobs creation. Uh, it depends a bit who you ask, but the most optimistic people say that there are about up to 2 million potential jobs in what we broadly call the green economy. I think it's also important to remember that most of these jobs are local, and they're in small and medium-sized enterprises. And these are jobs that can't be outsourced. When the local installer comes to install your thermostats at your home, that's a local job in the local economy that's not going to be outsourced to China. Also, many of the energy efficiency measures um, that you can make, and certainly many of the ones that Danfoss produce, have fairly um, short payback times. That means there is an upfront investment, of course, but fairly quickly you've paid that back. And once you've done that, the savings continue, and they free up money for other activities. Finally, and I said it before, there is the energy and the climate element. We can continue to lower our CO2 emissions without at the same, sorry, whilst improving our energy um, security. Again, it's quite simple. If we need less energy, then we also need to secure less energy. So I don't want you to be thinking that it's just me standing here telling you that this is a good thing. So I brought with me a few slides from a study. This study was commissioned by a group called Renovate Europe, which is an alliance of some of the leading energy efficiency companies. Um, I think we're about just under 20 of us. There are a few associations in there as well. And we commissioned a study from a Danish group called Copenhagen Economics to basically look at the benefits of energy efficiency and particularly at renovation as well. I think this is a really important point to make. I think the minister made it, but only implicitly. We have to look at renovation. As it stands, Europe-wide, the new build rate is 0.4% a year. Now that means, even if we're talking about 2050, 90% of the buildings that we'll be standing, that we'll be occupying in 2050, are already standing. So that means if we're serious about doing something for energy efficiency, we cannot just look at the new built stock. It's simply too small. We have to tackle the existing buildings. And that's what we want to do, as the name implies, with Renovate Europe. We really want to kickstart that renovation phase to, for the good of all of us. Anyway, back to the uh, report and the conclusion. It's up here in the first line. Basically, the overall conclusion is that it always pays off to do energy efficiency. It is what we call in Brussels a no-regrets option. As they also say, that's not actually something new. We've known that for a while. What is new, or what they are um, highlighting, is the fact that the combination of the high unemployment and the low uh, rates for borrowing costs means that this is actually the perfect time to start doing renovation at a larger scale. Then some people will say, well, yes, but if we use less energy, then the state is also recouping less tax on that energy. And that's correct, of course. But as this slide uh, proves, the money that you are losing on that recouped tax are more than offset by the reduced cost of energy used for the government's own buildings, by the lower cost of expanding the renewable uh, network that uh, Latvia is also obliged to do, 
Um, and finally, of course, people that are not on social benefits but are working, rather than costing money, will be bringing in money through our taxes. If you look at the overall benefits by 2020, then um, the Copenhagen economics are working with two scenarios. There is a more conservative one, the low energy efficiency, and then there's a more optimistic one, the high energy efficiency. But I think what I wanted to show you on this one, that even if you take the most conservative estimates, then you can see that they estimate that the net benefits from energy saving alone are around 50 billion euros. And then if you add other benefits, so reduced air pollution, health benefits, reduced outlay and subsidies for, for those who are unemployed or who have to get extra um, um, support, for instance, for, for, for energy bills, um, is up to about 100 billion. If you choose a high energy efficiency scenario, then that almost doubles. We are talking about the public sector today, so I brought this slide with me specifically to say, well, what about the public sector? Because they're financing all this, right? Um, and often you hear, well, yes, energy efficiency is important, but is it as important as tackling our other issues? Well, yes, it is, because if you look at this slide, and again, the most conservative scenario over here, you can see that they estimate that the loss of public revenue would be 4 billion euros, whereas the savings from energy savings alone would be 9 billion euros in the most conservative estimates. So you're more than, you're making more than double of what you're losing in terms of lost income. So this really illustrates for me that this is a no regrets option and we should all be doing this. The conclusions, they see it for me. I think we've already been through it. Energy efficient renovation of existing buildings, very attractive. Um, economic benefits, you're tackling the climate change and energy security. There are sizable co-benefits to um, society. And also, now really is the perfect time to do this because we can lucrate on the crisis rather than using that as an excuse uh, not to tackle this issue. I put in a couple of bonuses for you because now we're talking about sort of the short term. 2020, that's almost tomorrow in energy terms and we really need to get going now. But of course, we're also concerned about sort of the longer term future. What kind of Europe do we want to be? Are we really old Europe, as they say in the US increasingly? If we want to remain competitive, and ahead of the curve in the future, then this is also a way to do it. Because by investing in energy efficiency for our industry, for instance, that industry can produce much more efficiently and with that compete with the rest of the world. By the way, I mean, the Chinese, they know this. I mean, they're already now um, quite ambitious in terms of what they're doing to reduce their energy costs to make sure that they can also compete um, in the future. So if they're doing it, then we should be doing it. We should be doing it better. So, you have the keys to unlocking the energy efficiency future. I think that much is clear. I put up here just a few of the sort of key dossiers that uh, you will be working on in the years to come. The energy efficiency directive implementation as we're discussing today, but there are also other important um, directives such as the energy performance of buildings directive. Um, renewables is coming up. There's the energy package 2030 because what's happening in Brussels right now is we're discussing what are we going to do past 2020? What sort of goals and targets do we want to set up post-2020 to make sure that we're actually heading towards the sort of world we want? Finally, and I think particularly interesting from Latvia's point of view, and it was alluded to by the minister, the multi-annual financing framework and the structural funds, this is your opportunity to also have some of your projects funded by our European Commission. And I know that you've done so fairly successfully in Latvia in the past, but there are still more money and more opportunities to be had. So, again, I said before, uh, I'm not just standing here preaching to you. We also have some solutions that can help you do that. I'm not going to talk about those in details because my colleague will later. But just to say, as you can see here, we're not talking about complicated measures. If, for instance, we just fitted all radiators with thermostats throughout Europe, then in Germany alone, we could save 18 billion kilowatt hours on a yearly basis. That's a little thermostat. That's not a complicated thing. Uh, we're also talking about district energy and district heating. That's a key part of the energy efficiency directive. And again, you can see here, 517 million tons of CO2 could be saved if we doubled our use of district energy. Combined heat and power also tied up with uh, district energy. If you increase to 14%, then we would generate energy savings to save basically one year's production by all the world's windmills. And again, a Danish perspective. I am standing here as Danfoss, one of the Danish companies that has benefited from also the very ambitious um, 
strategy that we've had in Denmark for energy efficiency and renewables. And uh, I'm sure that my Danish colleagues will talk about this, so I'll not go into depth. But it's just to say, if, we, if we're all a little bit more Danish and we could save a substantial amount of energy, um, we could also, um, and Denmark has done so successful, decouple our economic growth that we do hope will return very soon uh, from our energy usage. And finally, energy security. It was mentioned by your minister as being an important issue for, for, for Latvia. Um, Denmark has managed to do that. We're actually now oversupplying, so we are net exporters of, of energy, and that is also a feasible future for, for Latvia. And with that, I'm done with my presentations. If you have any questions, uh, if you would like more information.